Ladies and gentlemen, on the affirmative team, we fundamentally believe that we should, that the government should not fund private schools. And we believe this for the reasons that I'll be presenting and for the reasons that my team will be presenting. I'll be talking about the role of the government has to play in education and how we can best achieve a quality of education by not funding private schools. My second speaker, Savannah, will be talking about the benefit that this will bring to public schools and the fact that this won't actually harm private schools in any way whatsoever. She'll also be talking about how this is the best way to end the stigma that is around public education as opposed to private education. So first of all, I'd like to move to the model we'll be using in tonight's debate. And that model is simple in the sense that all we'll be doing is stopping the funding that currently goes to private schools and redirecting that to public schools in need of the most support, in need of the most financial support in terms of perhaps creating programs to raise the salary and wages of teachers in those schools or providing better educational resources to schools in the most need. So we'd be taking away the funding that private schools currently receive and giving it to public schools, first of all, based off those in the most need. So first off to my first point, the role of government in education. And what we see, uh, the very nature of education, is that not only is it in individuals' best interests to have the highest education standard possible, it's also in society's best interests. Because this, mean that this means that individuals will be more productive, they'll be able to uh, create better futures not only for themselves, but also for society as a whole. So education is inherently important to the individual in terms of them developing their own individual skills and talents, but also for society and that will have a more skilled and will have a more productive workforce. So we realise that education is inherently important for everyone. And the government has a key role to play in this, in ensuring that the most minimum, the most basic standard of education is available to the most amount of people possible. And currently what we see under the current model of the government funding private schools, we're not creating this baseline of education equality that we really need to see. So what we would say under our model, by taking away the funding that private schools receive, the benefit that education brings to individuals and to society will be equalised because we will have more of a base, a more an equal base level and a higher standard of education for students everywhere, regardless of the fact as to whether they attend a public school or whether they attend a private school. So the government has a key role to play in this and we feel that the role is ensuring that education is equal across the board and the best way to do this is by not funding private schools. So ladies and gentlemen, for the reason that the best the best way to go about achieving this equality, this baseline, in, baseline equality in education, is by taking away the funding from private schools and allocating it to public schools. And for the reasons that my second speaker will address, the idea is that the benefit that this will bring to public schools as a whole and the lack of harm that this will actually cause to private schools and the fact that this will end the stigma associated with public education as opposed, to, as opposed to private education and for the very simple reason that every child in every society and in every school has the same basic right to a high quality education, I am proud to stand on the affirmative tonight. We think that the largest population that is going to be most affected by this policy change is not the higher up middle of the like, top private schools, but rather the middle of the range. Those that otherwise without this sort of funding cannot survive and really cannot stand on their own two feet. We think it is therefore the obligation of the government to improve their lives so, so much more and like just as much more as any public school within the government sector. We think like because of this, there is definitely no incentive to create a policy change which disadvantages so much more children than it actually benefits. So before I begin my speech, I'd like to point out um, like some rebuttal uh, and like say why the other team were wrong. So this, like, in this, there have been like one main issue that the affirmative team have tried to stand on today. Firstly, this idea of whether the government has a role. What we heard was essentially that. The government has a role to provide the best sort of benefits to the most amount of people. And we tell you that is absolutely true. Like, the government has a role to play in providing the most amount of social benefit. We think that like, our system provides far more benefits than their system could ever provide. We think like, the government has a moral obligation to provide equality to every single school, irregardless, like, regardless of whether or not they're a private or public institution. But it is the job of the government to provide an equal standard, some sort of level playing field to improve those groups. 
What happens when you remove that funding from a lot of private schools? What it does is it does two things. Firstly, it lowers the standard of, edu of education in a lot of public schools around that area because now they have more students going into that system. But re like more importantly, it creates a greater inequality between public schools that are currently in the system who already are strained by multiple students being in them and now an elite private school sector that only exists for schools such as Hale, such as PLC. We think that is a far greater inequality and far more harmful to the improvement of society when you reduce that. We think like ultimately their model fails to address a lot of the student-based problems and should apply to a lot of schools. And we think that therefore it is like really harmful when they want to talk about those kinds of issues. So now to my substantive matter. I'm going to talk about two issues. Firstly, why we think it is like the role of government um, to like provide the same amount of benefits to all schools, and secondly, why it is bad for the public sector. Under this first idea of like the principle of why it's important that like the government has an equal playing field for all. We think that the government ultimately has an obligation to help as many people as possible, and we think like this is very much in the same sense. We think that like the private school system is very much an opt-in system, and therefore it is right for you to pay more. But what we think is more important is that you have some sort of like uh, aid from the government telling you that what your choice of, that the choice that you are making is far like far more beneficial for you, and therefore like everybody has the same sort of equitable outcomes. We also think that for a lot of people that want to go into the private school system, it isn't because they so much have the capabilities and the resources, but rather that they would love an access to religious, edu religious education. We think that is far more beneficial like, under our side when we allow those people the opportunity and the benefits for like, them to have some sort of like, uh, like funding process and therefore have their costs redistributed. We think that is far more beneficial under our side and we think it's ultimately the, a government's obligation to protect those kinds of people. Secondly, on to why we think like, it's bad for certain public schools. As I told you in my introduction, the public school, private schools that are going to be most affected are those in the middle of the range. If those schools can't operate and then have to shut down, what happens is those individuals will now have to move to public school systems within that sector. We think that like, creates a large strain on those public systems, and we think that's extremely harmful for a lot of systems that already cannot operate to the best of their ability. We think when you create a greater strain on those systems, it means that the government have to support them in some way. It means that it's a greater cost for the government to provide some sort of benefit for those people. We think that is far more harmful than anything that the affirmative want to bring out later in their speeches about how it could be beneficial for some. We think like this greater cost to the government means that like it has a larger impact on whole of society in terms of taxes and etc. That we think that like people will now have to flood into the public school system which is already failing and we think that's far more beneficial and is extremely bad. It's for these two reasons that we're always happy to oppose. are trying to prove to you today is not that governments have the responsibility to give the same amount of funding to every single person in their country, but instead it is their responsibility to try and provide the best access to standard things like education that they can, even if this means an inequality in funding. Today I will be talking about two points for my case, one of them being that um, getting rid of funding from private schools will not adversely affect private schools, but it will lead to a great increase in the standards of public schools. My second point will be that funding private schools through the government will perpetuate the stigma that we have around private school education. But before I do that, I will rebut the other team's case. So the first thing that we heard from the negative team is that the government has a responsibility to give the same amount of funding to every um, citizen and that it has the responsibility to provide help to every person in areas such as education. Well, what we, the affirmative team, is really arguing is that the <clears throat> equality of opportunity is much more important than the equality of funding. We would much rather have every student in Australia having a basic standard of education even if that means that people who have to, um, who have to put their children in pro um, public schools because they are the lowest socioeconomic status get more funding from the government. Because at the end of the day, you want every single child who comes out of the schooling system in Australia to have the same level and to not be affected adversely by their socioeconomic status because this is simply not fair. We also do not think that um, people going to a private school will overload the public school system once some of the private schools need to shut down because of um, less funding. We think this because 
private schools can already charge whatever they would like in terms of fees. So we don't think that they're going to have a problem making up for the lack of funding from the government. We also think that people who send their children to private school already have money to pay. And <clears throat> next we heard this idea that um, people need the benefits that private schools can offer. Well, this is what we are trying to get rid of. We want every school in Australia to offer the same benefits. And this is why we think that more funding needs to go to public schools. So this leads to my first point. My first point is that um, getting funding um, away from private schools will not adversely affect private schools because they can already charge whatever they want. They can make up for the lack <clears throat> of funding from the government because they can just simply put their school fees up. People who put their children in private schools can already pay that amount. This is not going to affect them. Whereas diverting these resources to public schools is going to lead to a greater increase in the standard of education there because they can do things like pay for better facilities and for better teaching staff. And all that this does is close the gap between children who go to public school and children who go to private school, and we think that all of those children should have the same level of education. Secondly, we think that governments who, um, the government supporting and funding private schools means that they are saying that we think that government-funded schools are not as good and we would like to support, um, we would like to support private schools because our basic standard that we're offering in our school and the public system is not adequate. And we think that this is a terrible thing to tell the society and to have put forth into the society because we don't think that any children should be disadvantaged and feel as if employers are only employing them because they um, they went to a public or a private school because the only reason that you can't that you have to choose which which school you go to is because of your socio-economic status and we don't think that that should have an effect on your opportunities in the future and it is for these reasons that we think that private schools should not be funded by the government Ladies and gentlemen, the affirmative team wants to tell you that they want education to be equal and accessible for all people. What they're failing to understand is the negative team here this evening is showing you the demonstrable, like, actual harms that their model is going to be providing to education and to public education in particular. I have two points in today's debate. The first of these is relating to like religious people like being moved into like the public system and the harm this is going to do uh, to the public education system. And secondly, the impact on like the pricing out of people from like elite schools and like the additional harm this is going to be doing to people who like would otherwise have been in the private system and are now being kicked out of it. But first, a couple of points in rebuttal. So the affirmative team wants to tell you that like implementing their model is going to mean that like education is now going to be like more equal, more accessible, um, like everyone's gonna be able to do it. What we're telling you is that two like two like actual harms are going to result from this. The first of these is there's going to be a widening gap between like the public system and the private system and we're going to have like this these like elite public schools and all these like generic public uh, public schools and that gap is like a clear harm to education the second of those my first speaker told you about this is that there's going to be like a flood of people like from the public system into the private sorry from the private system into the public system from these like middle range private schools as soon as like they can no longer operate because they're not getting government funding all the people from these schools are going to head it straight into the public system going to increase the burden on the taxpayer um, to like continue to support this public system and it's going to decrease the overall quality um, of like public education. The affirmative team tried to tell you in second there that like equality of opportunity is more important than equality of funding. And this is exactly what we're trying to say. Like currently we recognise that there isn't like an inequality of funding between like um, public schools and private schools. But like under like under the status quo, there is still more of an equality of opportunity because it allows like the costs um, to the government of running public schools to be lower, which means public schools can like operate um, like a, like a better quality of education, which means that the equality of opportunity is actually going to be reduced under their model. The affirmative team also tried telling you that like private schools can just charge like whatever they want and that people could afford it, um, and that like under their model like that will just continue. No, this is not the case, and I'll tell you why later on. But basically, what's going to happen is that like the people who are currently attending like these elite private schools, they're immediately going to be like priced out of the system, receive a lower quality of education, and that education is going to suffer as a result. So on to substantive material. My first point is what's going to happen is like what's going to happen as soon as you're going to close these like middle range, largely religious private schools that we've going that we've shown are going to be like completely cut out of the market because like government funding is the only way these moderately priced schools are going to survive. What's going to happen is that like the largely religious clientele of these schools are going to be immediately forced into the public system 
and it's going to create a much more heavily religious environment in these public schools than there is currently. It's going to create more pressure on these public schools to provide like religious education services, which is in direct contradiction to the ideas that we have about like secular education being valuable. Like the government provides secular education, private schools provide religious education, like that's the status quo. Like if their model is implemented, there's going to be like this whole flood of like religious students being moved straight into the public into the public system, and there's going to be an increased pressure for like these public schools to no longer be like that secular. And like they can try telling you that like these like non-religious people can just like go to a different school or like be non-religious somewhere else, but like that realistically can't happen because like all public schools would just end up being like more religious than they are now. And like where can they otherwise go? Like a non-religious private school? Like they basically don't exist. If they did, they'd probably charge like a heap of money, which most of them wouldn't be able to afford. My second point is what's going to happen as a result of like this widening gap between um, like these elite private schools um, and like the rest of the public system. What's going to happen with this withdrawal of funding for these elite private schools is that like they're going to have to raise their prices. Like that's obviously just going to happen. They're going to have to raise their prices. But like the like the biggest impact of this is that the people who are going to be priced out are the ones who just like cannot like can barely currently afford that elite private school education. They're the ones who really, really value education. They probably can't actually like afford this elite education, but they scrimp and they save as much as they possibly can to get their kids into the best possible education they can have because they really value education. As soon as we jack the prices up in these elite private schools, these people immediately get priced out of the system. And first of all, they're denied a good education, like they're sent into like the generic public school system, which like I'm sure the affirmative team can't deny does not provide like as good an educational quality. And secondly, like it eliminates this really important value that like this like aspect of the community does, that like they really value education and they're like prepared to scrimp and save and spend as much money as they need to in order to afford it. And like as soon as we eliminate this value by sending them back into the public system and not valuing education, we get rid of this like community value that's like propels social mobility um, and means they can like continue to like value education and instill this value in future generations. And it's for these reasons that we are proud to oppose. Poor kids are already priced out of the public system. It's not a case of parents scrimping and saving to manage to send their child out of poverty to this elite private school. No, those positions are decided about 15 years earlier when the child at birth is registered to attend by wealthy parents who know how to enter into that system. This isn't a case of preventing poor kids from getting an elite education. It's making sure poor kids can get an education that we can be proud of in this country rather than one we should be ashamed of. Two main points to respond to. First, why equal funding certainly does not um, equate to equal outcomes. And secondly, why religion is not the role of the state anyway and is not important in this debate. So first, why the equality of outcome is far more important than the equality of funding and why in fact we end up with a better system when we allow the government to spend the money where it is needed rather than where it is wanted by the rich. What we heard from the negative, ironically, was that they really wanted a level playing field in this debate. They want everyone to have the same kinds of opportunities. The problem when the government is funding rich kids' trips to France instead of fixing broken windows in a disadvantaged school in a remote community is that there is no kind of equality of opportunity in that situation. Money is being wasted on the kinds of advantages that rich children are always going to have by virtue of having rich parents, but it is not directed to those communities where it is most needed and where it can have most impact. As for this idea that what we really care about in this debate are the kids from the middle ground, those who go to the not so expensive private schools, on the one hand the negative has absolutely failed to show that these are going to stop working because of the current policy. They haven't told you why they exist so on the margins that the government funding is all that stands between them and bankruptcy. But even if we take that as read, what exists in this situation isn't these kids being forced then into a poor generic level of public education. No, because these kinds of private schools already exist in the kinds of suburbs that have good public education by virtue of being within wealthy, rich suburbs. These kids are going to go to schools that can already well afford to take them, that the teaching standard isn't going to go down very much at, that already have the kinds of resources that are directed there because people who are better off pressure for better public school systems, and that's what you see in the better off places where these public, private schools exist in the first place. 
Moving then to look at this second issue of why religion is not the role of the state and why it's not really a matter for this debate in any case anyway. And also why the exposure to religion of people in public schools isn't a harm because we like diversity. Okay, first, we say it is good that we are not funding any more as the state this kind of religious education because we don't think the state should have any role in that. The separation between it and the church is a good one, and one that means that the state is not telling anyone what they should believe or what they shouldn't believe by virtue of where the funding is going. That is good, and that is an outcome that we stand for in this debate. But when we move these kids, assuming these schools are even closed, to public schools, on the one hand, we think religion is going to become more of a private matter, not a public one. We're not suddenly going to be employing chaplains for half the day at schools. No, that's not going to be the role of government. The role of government is to spend that money on kids who need it most, who won't even be in these schools in the first place because they're in the well-off suburbs. The money will be redirected instead to those schools that actually need it. But on the other hand, even if we end up with this situation where suddenly there's Bible groups, say, in the library at lunchtime, we think that's a good thing. We think it's good that children should have exposure to this diversity of opinion that is denied them because rich parents are taking their children out of public education and placing them in these private schools where there is no exposure to these different kinds of views. We think that is an excellent outcome, even if it happens in this debate at all. In conclusion, then, should we give the highest base of education possible in this country by redirecting funding, yes. And does funding the worse off schools get us there? Yes. That is why I propose. Ladies and gentlemen, we on the negative scene of this side of the debate acknowledge the disparity in the status quo between high end private schools, middle end pri private schools, and public schools. What the affirmative team does is fail to acknowledge the complexity of the education system and the fact that it's not just a matter of private schools and public schools, but a far more complex nature of low SES public schools, high SES public schools, low SES private schools, and high SES private schools. What are the three main issues in this debate? Firstly, what is the role of government in uh, funding for private schools? What is the impact of this model on public schools and education? What is the impact on this model on private education? Firstly, on this role of education, the government, the affirmative team said that the government needs to provide a quality of education, firstly, equality of opportunity, and then they wanted to talk about a quality of outcome uh, in this debate. So we think that on the negative side, we think that people should be able to opt in and to pay extra to provide for their own education if they want to do so. And we see that the government does this in other instances when it comes to health provision. And we think that that's totally okay, and we are very happy to support that decision of the negative side of the debate. Secondly, they wanted to talk about this idea of the equality of opportunity um, and outcome. And while they have failed to acknowledge all the analysis on our side of the debate, which has shown that the access to education will decrease overall as a response to their model coming through, and I'll explain that a bit later on in the debate. So secondly, onto this issue about the benefits to public schools as a result of this model. So the affirmative team came up with this really simple analysis that all of this funding that's currently going to private schools would simply be redirected from rich schools to poor schools. Stop funding rich students for going on tours to France and supporting public schools in fixing broken windows. The issue we have with this, with this um, substantive this material is that they ignore our analysis saying that because of a closing down of a lot of these middle level private schools, which I'll explain to you later, there will be a much greater presence and like, pressure on the public education system to provide these services. Currently, the government provides $2,000 per student uh, in a private education system towards their funding, whereas they provide $11,000 per student per annum in the public sector. The more students you have in the public sector, the more money the government will have to spend, unless it, compared to if that child was in the private sector. Therefore, we think that the idea that funding will be better distributed is false because the government will have to spend more money as there are more people in public schools. So thirdly, onto this issue about the benefits to the private system. So as we talk, talked about, um, a lot of these kind of private schools that we wanted to talk about, the middle level private schools, will like fall below and not be able to operate. They wanted, to, they wanted the analysis, we gave you this the whole time, but one last time for you. They said that people will not be priced out of the system. The, what we want to show you is that a lot of these middle income schools, these middle income private schools, we're talking about uh, say Bridges Outs in the Hills, St. Stephen's up north, the northern suburbs, they don't have competing high level public schools within them. We're not talking about like, the golden, like the western suburbs private schools that have Shenton or Perth Modest as an alternative. We're talking about the really outer end 
private schools that don't have good alternative public schools. What are their options? So that I wanted to tell you that they could just raise their prices. The problem with this is that a lot of the people in these in these schools will not be able to afford that three thousand dollars more per child. They often send multiple children to this school. They can't afford that to make the gap. What else is going to happen? They will probably lower the quality of education in these schools. And we think that lowering the quality of education is something that the other team just wanted to will argue against and we don't see why they would be happy to lower the quality of education by $3,000 per child in these schools. So what we think will actually happen is that these schools, are, if they do like, raise the cost of their education, people will pull out. If they lower the quality of their education, people will pull out and these schools will not be able to operate because they will not have the students to attend their school. We will see a large exodus of students outside of these middle income private schools going to the public education system and really putting pressure on the public edu education system leading to a worse distribution of funding across the board. We think that overall, um, we think that public schools will be really, really harmed by this process because there will be a large exodus of students from the private education system and we think that overall this, this model will result in greater harm to public schools, greater harm to private schools and is not principally justified and this is why I'm proud to oppose. Thank you. First of all, congratulations to both teams on what I thought was a very high quality of debate this evening. So a round of applause for both teams. <laughs> if you've heard of oral, oral adjudication before, you'll know that I'll split it up into the three ends, math, matter, manner, and method. Matter being what was said in the debate, manner being how speakers presented themselves, and method being how they structured their speeches. And so first of all, I'll start with manner. And tonight I was really impressed with the standard of manner across the board. I was very impressed with the use of eye contact, the use of palm cards, uh, and the use of pace and volume generally. I mean, in some instances, we'd have speakers speaking a little bit too quickly, uh, and that's something to kind of think about and reflect on for future rounds. But across the board, uh, I was very impressed with the standard of manner, and I didn't feel that one team had a manner advantage tonight. In terms of method, I was also impressed with the structure of both teams and with the use of rebuttal uh, in tonight's debate. There was a lot of clash and a lot of engagement with the other team's ideas, which is what we want to see in debating. So again, I didn't feel like there were any method advantages this evening, although there were a few timing issues. However, that didn't play into my decision this evening. So in terms of matter, which is what did decide tonight's debate and is what we want to see decide any good debate. For me, the debate came down to two key issues, and that was the role of the government in providing equal opportunity and how we can create uh, the best the best outcome for both private students and public students. So from the affirmative, what we heard was that it was the role of the government to provide equal opportunity and the best and the highest standard of education possible. And the negative agreed to this idea, but what they disagreed to was the model presented by the affirmative that we would take away the funding that currently goes to private schools and redistribute that to public schools. The negative countered this by saying that it was a far more complex issue and the model presented by the affirmative was a little bit too simplistic. So whilst the negative accepted the importance of equal opportunity and the role of the government, uh, what they did say and what they did present with thorough analysis was that this actually wasn't the best way to go about implementing this change and this benefit to society. So what we did hear from the negative was that by changing the funding directed at private schools, we'd actually see more harm to both public schools and to private schools, in that we'd see a mass exodus, basically, of students from private schools, the middle ground private schools, um, with families who currently send their students there because they value education, uh, not simply because they, they have money to do so. It's these, these families, this middle ground area, that the affirmative didn't really address in tonight's debate and suffer the most uh, from this change in funding. So there'd be a mass exodus to public schools who are currently already under-equipped to deal uh, with this amount of students. And also, private schools would lose their students by having to raise their fees. And this would widen the gap in education, which was actually what the model, uh, the affirmative proposed, was trying to fix. And so for the reasons that this bad outcome would result for public schools and for private schools, and the fact that we didn't, I didn't feel we heard enough analysis or an answer to this from the affirmative, that I've decided to give tonight's debate to the negative team by a close but clear margin.